I uh, just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Again, we are here for the Society of Thoracic Surgeons um, monthly webinar for April. Um, on the call with me today from STS, we have myself, we have Carol, we have Addie. Um, let's see, I think that's it from STS. And then from our IQVIA team, we've got Chris, Jean, Melanie, Joe, um, and Rhonda. And from our core group, we've got uh, two of our core group members joining us today. We've got Katie and Melissa. So thank you everyone for joining um, the call today. Um, Let's see here. Next, uh, for, again, for the agenda, we'll have our um, STS update, and then um, I'm, we're going to play a presentation um, for AQO abstracts, and then we will turn things over to IQVIA. Um, Melanie's going to um, give the IQVIA presentation today, and then we'll end, as usual, with um, our user feedback section. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to uh, please put those in the Q&A um, box. Use, again, use the Q&A function, not the chat. Um, so Again, just please um, put any of your questions into that Q&A um, function. All right, uh, for our STS updates, um, let's go ahead and tackle spring and fall 2020 harvest analysis. Um, no, they are not back yet. Um, the spring 2020 analysis results are expected um, next month in May. Um, and then shortly thereafter that, we will be releasing those fall 2020 um, results. So um, prior to releasing those, um, obviously STS and um, some of our beta, test beta testers will be looking at that data before it's um, released out to um, everyone. We just want to make sure that that data is being presented um, as, as expected. And um, so we are looking forward to getting you those results um, as quickly as we can. And again, thank you all very much um, for your patience as we work to get this um, data out to you. Um, for spring 2021 harvest, you guys are, I'm sure most everyone is well aware that harvest close date is still to be determined. Um, there was a request from the task force and um, that they, that we did want to provide an opportunity for you all to review that 2020 data um, prior to setting that harvest um, close. So um, with that harvest close date again, will be coming once um, you all have that spring 2020 data to look at. Um, we will, SDS and IQVIA will get together, we'll establish that um, new close date for spring 20, for spring 21. And um, again, obviously we'll give you all um, of a, a, an advance notice of at least two weeks prior to the new close date. Um, you know, ideally we always give at least a month. So, but at a very bare minimum, you all would have at least two weeks prior um, notice to that new close date. Um, as some of you may know, um, the 2021 audit is um, underway. Uh, selected sites were notified on Monday of this week. Um, so if you were one of those lucky um, persons, you should have gotten notified by Emily on Monday. Um, shortly after that, um, audit instruction emails have also been sent um, by CRS. So if you were a selected site and you have not gotten your audit instruction emails from CRS, uh, please uh, follow up with Emily. Um, her email is here on the screen again. Uh, please contact Emily Conrad with any audit questions. Um, she can be reached at econrad at sts.org. Next slide, please. Um, just a, real quick, wanted to go over the um, data uh, 5.21 version update in case uh, for new people who are just joining um, the webinars. Um, again, just real quick, our go live is scheduled for July 1. Uh, data specifications were sent to vendors in December. Um, as you're aware, all of our upgrade webinars have been completed. Um, Carol did an amazing job uh, walking through the data collection form um, and explaining all the elements. So if you have not had a chance to look at those upgrade webinars, they are all they were all um, recorded and they are posted out on the webinars page. So if you get a chance, again, please go back and review those upgrade webinars. Um, again, Carol and team did an amazing job walking through that data collection form. Um, also, just a reminder that the 5.21 data collection form that is posted on the STS website at this time is, is still a draft version. Um, it's near final. Um, I do have some additional cleanup to do, some formatting. Um, so just please note that that is still in draft, um, draft form. Um, the final version will be coming um, very soon, obviously, well, you know, prior to the start of uh, July 1. So that draft format, that draft version will be cleaned up and we'll have that final version out, um, out here soon. Um, also for the 5.21 update, um, we are implementing um, your, the 5.21 version will have on save checks. Um, these have already been created. The um, on save checks will be implemented into your vendor software. So again, we did this um, to, to help um, 
to try and help minimize data cleanup efforts um, after the data has been submitted. So we're trying to catch a bunch of these things um, before your data comes over to ITV and it's submitted. So, um, you know, again, implementing non-safe checks, um, surgery dates, greater than discharge date, mortality date, less than discharge date, things like that. So um, that, those types of on-safe checks will be implemented within your vendor software for this new 5.21 version. So we hope you find those very helpful and hopefully will help to minimize, take some time away from that cleanup effort. So um, our training manual development is underway. Um, so Carol, Katie, and Melissa, the core group are working very, very hard on revamping the new training manual. It is going to be very much better, very much better, I don't know if that's proper English, will be um, better organized. It'll be a lot more user friendly. Um, they are spending a lot of time and putting a lot of effort um, into this new training manual. It is definitely a labor of love. It is a lot of work and a lot of hard work. Um, so um, again, we are working very hard to get that new training manual um, improved and out to you all. Let's see, next slide, Carol. Um, since we do have A2O coming up, um, it is coming soon and well, not coming soon, it'll be um, coming here in October. Um, and prior to um, AQO, we will be opening the abstract submission period for any of uh, you all that would like to submit abstracts for um, this year's AQO. Um, I did um, want to mention, you know, last year at AQO, we did not have any um, abstract submissions for general thoracic. So I would like to um, to change that this year. So I um, feel like, you know, a lot of hospitals are doing QI um, improvements there at your facilities. And, um, you know, it would be great to share that um, information uh, with your colleagues and with us, you know, at AQO. So again, um, Patty Thor gave um, a presentation on the ACSD webinar <clears throat> regarding abstract submissions. And she gave an excellent presentation and she tailored it, you know, for all databases. So I wanted to play this um, recording of the presentation that she gave on the adult webinar um, for you all. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Carol slash Patty and um, we'll get this um, Patty's presentation playing for you all. So thank you. Okay, let me just get to the time here, Leanne. <clears throat> Yep. You're not to listen to the Thank whole you. thing. Yep. Okay. There we go. Okay. And now we are going to hand it over. There you go. Claire from Thank you. the uh, Michigan Society of Thoracic Surgeons to talk to us about abstracts. Do not fear. Abstract season is here. And Patty's sharing her screen and we see it. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for having me talk, Carol. Um, People that know me know that um, posters are my favorite part of AQL, and it's for several reasons. First of all, I think my attention span is very limited, so I love to run through the poster session, look at the pretty colors and graphs, read the introduction and conclusion, and then decide if I want to spend my time reading the entire poster. And the second thing is I always find something on these posters that I can take back that is useful to my practice always, always, and I meet the greatest people, and I always appreciate the effort and the time they've taken to share their stories. And the AQO um, committee has made it really simple to learn how to create an abstract, and it's really geared for every single one of us to try our hand at abstract writing. So I'm just going to go along and explain the basics of writing an abstract, and I've included pearls of wisdom from the real experts, Morley Herbert and Simba Prince from Dallas, Texas. So thank you, Morley and Simma. Simply put, an abstract is a short story that helps you connect to the audience. And many of us have the same interests, challenges, and issues at our centers. You will show that you've identified a project, a problem, a research question, what you did to correct the problem or conduct the study, and what happened as a result, or what did you discover? Topics for the STS abstracts must use STS national data fields or your custom fields to show the results of the scientific research, your quality improvement project, your data abstraction process improvement project, whatever you choose. And your imagination is the only limit. And you're in the best position to know what your data shows and all the hard work that your site has done. And this is applicable to adult cardiac, congenital thoracic, and congenital. You will be asked to identify what type of abstract you're submitting, either it's scientific or quality improvement. I always struggled with these because the lines are kind of blurred to me. 
while it seems they're blurred, but scientific abstracts really are research projects where you are testing a hypothesis to create new knowledge, or quality improvement abstracts typically are related to a hospital activity demonstrating change in behavior or outcome. You have to remember that these abstracts must be original work, not something that was presented at, by your site, your hospital representative at a previous national meeting. This is just a sample abstract that was submitted in 2018 that I like that shows um, the different sections of the abstract, the title, the background, methods, result, and conclusion. And you can see they included a nice graph to visually display the results. So I'm going to go through each section. The title is the one of the most important parts of the abstract. It's the first impression. Therefore, you want it to be great. You want it to be accurate. You don't want to mislead them. And it has to be consistent with your project. It kind of identifies what the project is about. It should be compelling because you want the committee and eventually the audience who's looking at posters, you want them to see the poster. And it should orientate and orient them pretty quickly. Some of the examples I provided here show that you know exactly what this poster is about. A multidisciplinary approach to decreasing intraoperative blood product use, usage in coronary artery bypass surgery. This was from St. Elizabeth Health Center in Youngstown, Ohio. This is an older poster, but it was one of those early posters that showed a multidisciplinary approach to intraoperative blood decreasing. It really showed us early on that one single intervention is unlikely to stand out when you're doing so many things with so many team members, and that's okay. And the results were phenomenal at a time when everybody was looking at blood transfusions. Um, improving data collection through a strategic data management plan from our colleagues at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This is our congenital colleagues. By implementing a data collection, a new data collection process. They implemented new training procedures, monthly reconciliation, and they were able to decrease their missing data significantly. It was very impressive. And I think that is some, even though it's congenital and we're not all congenital, there's something in that poster for each and every one of us. Prevention of post-operative atrial fibrillation and cardiac surgery from Green Bay, Wisconsin. They shared their AFib prophylaxis protocol in the poster. They showed results that decreased the post-op AFib from 30% to 12%. And who doesn't want those numbers? That was amazing. The last example is the impact of a dedicated thoracic unit on post-operative pneumonia rate following lobectomy and lung cancer from Northside Hospital Cancer Institute. This was obviously from the general thoracic surgery database. And they focused on pneumonia. And that is obviously an outcome followed by every single thoracic surgery program. Uh, and, they, and this poster actually became an amazing resource for people. These are just some um, examples of important titles. The background is where you explain the problem or your research question. Explain why it is important and why it matters to others. The background should be strong. You're competing for people's attention because everyone's busy. So you want to keep it simple. A brief one to two sentence summary of the study's purpose and current state of research in the field. It can include what is known, believed to be known, or the question to be answered. You only want to put relevant information here. A common mistake in abstract writing is you start to explain how you conducted your project, and this is not the place in the background. The, back, the place for that is in the methods, where you will explain how you conducted your study or implemented your project. You want to state what patients were included, excluded, how the analysis of the data was carried out, clearly and briefly explain how you did what you did. And this is not a place to explain why. That was in your, in your background. And this one right here is the most common reason an author is requested to revise their work. The abstract results are the beat of the abstract. The data shows what happened as a result of your analysis or your intervention. This is a summary of your findings and must include data. Tables and graphs are um, an excellent tool, but they are limited. You can only have one or the other. And there's actual um, limits to the number of columns and rows your tables can have. Um, but in the poster, you can put as many pretty 
figures and graphs as you want. And these tables and graphs really help with the word count because they're not included in the word count for your abstract. It is a big reminder when percentages are used, the absolute numbers should be presented. And a little tip is don't repeat all your data in the results that you're putting in your table because the table is a time word space saver. And the tables and figures actually should speak for themselves. Statistical support is helpful. You want to know that the changes that you made were actually statistically meaningful. There's simple downloadable stats programs that can be helpful. You can phone a friend, you can partner with colleagues that have maybe a master's degree or a DMP, residents, nurse practitioners, practitioners, PAs sometimes are familiar with statistics. And also to remind you that regional comparisons are not allowed. The abstract conclusion is a concise wrap up of what ties in the background or problem statement and the result. There's no need to re repeat the same words over and over in the results, but think why the audience can benefit from this knowledge. There's another tip here that this is where you want to make sure the reader knows what you want them to know. Make it short and sweet and drive home your point. You want to leave the review committee and eventually the um, audience, they really want to read your poster by reading this conclusion. Some people actually will walk, walk up to or look at an abstract and read the title and the conclusion. So if you haven't attached, if you grab their attention at that point, you probably lost them. So to wrap up, you have to be aware of the abstract submission guidelines and follow them. There is a word limit of 250 words and that's difficult. It's really, really difficult. And that's why I repeated, keep it concise, keep it brief. And remember to consider your audience. Local terms on the East Coast might not be understood on the West Coast. Watch your acronyms and abbreviations for the same reason. We always suggest having someone give it a, a proofread or second pair of eyes because you know what you're saying and you know it might not be all that clear. The other caution is to remember you're representing your hospital. You want to make sure that you have approval to publish these data because that's really what you're doing is putting data out there in, in a published manner. The guidelines look like this. And if you read these and you follow these, these are a fantastic guide for, for abstract writing. This is just the process of submitting your abstract. You will get an, um, an online notification. It's so easy now just to upload the different sections of the abstract, really easy peasy. Um, the review committee um, gets back to you and either you can get your abstract accepted, reject, rejected, or request for revision. Typically revisions are because you didn't follow a guideline. And if you can follow the guidelines, change it up a little bit, resubmit it, then you'll be asked to create a poster. And now the meeting virtually is even easier because it's just a PowerPoint slide. So in conclusion, we all know that the last year has been really challenging for each and every one of us. Quality and research has definitely looked different and continues to look different at our site. Although I know that there's many, many good things that have occurred and continue to occur. So please don't be intimidated because it really is easier than it looks. There's multiple examples available. Um, and it's great to share your success. We had um, the privilege of listening to Jerry O'Connor he was a 20 year director of the Northern New England study group. And he actually told us the best part of collaborative work is sharing graciously and stealing shamelessly. I think posters make it really, really easy to share our great results. Oops. And here's just some posters from last year and as my exit, Carol. <laughs> Patty, Patty, this was a, a really great clear, concise presentation. Uh, thank you very much. It means a lot that you were able to present and did a great job with this. Um, I, I just re I really urge everybody, don't be intimidated by this. I know that every site is doing something with their, with their data and making improvements. And now it's time to showcase what your site is doing. Um, don't feel like you have to be an academic center. Um, Everybody, even you know, at the very local hospitals, are doing amazing things internally, and 
sharing that information with everybody improves the care of all patients, uh, not just at your hospital, but but every every patient that's being cared for with cardiothoracic surgery can benefit from from what you're doing at your hospital. So uh, I just urge you when we do open the submissions up, that information will be coming and we'll be sharing more information about it. But please take the opportunity to um, talk internally at your facility. See if if you have a project that you have results on that you're seeing, it doesn't have to be good results either, right? It can be something that maybe you tried, you thought it was going to work and maybe it didn't turn out the way that you thought it was going to, but in the process, there's always something learned. So it's um, it's always that take it back and review it and make changes going forward and how the process of quality improvement evolves is really what is it, uh, the most interesting to folks. So just, uh, I urge you to take the lead. I think just to review it, um, have our abstract team review it and um, share it with folks throughout the meeting. And this is gonna be one of the bigger HUL meetings. So I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you, Patty. And I, I've enjoyed working with you. So I appreciate you taking time to present on this. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Okay, Leanne, I'm handing it back over to you. Oopsie. Thank you, Carol. Appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, thank you. And of course, you know, thank you to Patty. Patty couldn't be um, on here today with us. So, um, and again, I apologize for all of our technical di difficulties. We're we're a little uh, we're a little challenged on that today. So, um, again, thank you for your patience. So, um, again, I just you know, want to reiterate what Carol said there at the end. Um, you know, please don't hesitate. Please, uh, you know, we encourage you to submit your abstract. Um, again, we, you know, just we had we did not have any general thoracic abstracts last year for AQO. So I really would like to see those um, this year uh, for our general thoracic database. So again, just encourage you. And if you have any questions regarding the abstracts, again, you know, just please reach out. I'm happy to assist in any way. So um, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Melanie um, for our IQVIA portion. Thank you. Thanks, Leanne. Thanks, Carol. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, so this will be an actual interactive portion for the IQVIA update. Um, in regards to past releases, we did not have anything that went out specifically for GTSD. Um, and if you do currently have a ticket that's submitted uh, via our support team, we are reviewing those items. So um, please know that we will be reaching back out to you if you do have tickets that um, you have submitted to us. Um, so with that, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, this will be just a refresher. Um, so let me get the right screen up. Okay. And if someone can just confirm, I have the it's platform. Confirmed. All right, yep. all confirmed. Okay, <laughs> so of course, this is probably very familiar for many of you on the call, but I know we do have new new data managers that do join. Um, and we have ha have had questions in the past in regards to just specific things within the platform and just tips and tricks and um, general navigation. So this would just be that high level um, overview. And if you did have questions, of course, we could take those towards the end of the call. But for now, I just wanted to go through the different areas within the platform for General Thoracic um, and just make sure that people are aware of what's available and the tools that you have to be able to review the data that you submit to the data warehouse. So once you log into the platform, um, the general landing place for the majority of our users is usually at the upload um, window. But we do have users that also use the direct data entry in which you're able to enter in the information directly into the platform and not use the direct data entry, I mean, the uh, uploader. So, but for this walkthrough, I'll just stick to the uploader aspect. And basically this is where you would take that exported file that you export out of the software vendor system um, and 
upload that to the IQVIA platform. And once that's uploaded, you will have a historical reference of these uploader cards. And on these cards, it would give you details to let you know the status of that actual submission. So just to give a quick overview, because we do get questions in regards to, well, what does it mean when it has a green check versus a red X next to an entry? Um, because these are significant. You need to know the status of the submission. So when you see a green check next to an entry and you actually confirm the status by looking at this processing status, it will basically let you know that your upload was completed. Um, but when you see an entry and it has a red X next to it, and if it has a processing status that says S3 completed, that actual submission did not complete um, and that actually failed. And so there's another report that I will also navigate to so you can see that information also. But if you are encountering those types of errors and um, you need, of course, to get your submissions in, that's when you would, of course, reach out to our support team to see what's occurring in those instances. So the other thing that you would, of course, make sure that you're paying attention to is the fact that you'll have indicators or icons that will appear on those submissions. And so the common indicators that you would see is usually a yellow X and a blue triangle with a wrench, which indicates um, for the, the yellow X, an error message was encountered. And then for the blue triangle with the wrench, that indicates a warning was encountered. There's another indicator that would appear that is a red X also. And if you encounter that indicator on the submission, then that means a critical error was encountered. And so to understand the different levels of those severity, the critical error message, if you encounter that, it will basically mean that the file has encountered on an individual record, most likely, and it, the system will tell you that there is an un unexpected value or entry. And so basically it did not align with what's expected um, with uh, according to the data specification. And so in those instances, when you see a critical error, it will prevent that record from being added to the database. And so in those instances, it will give you a message and it will tell you the actual record ID, patient ID, um, and the field that it's encountering. Um, and at that point, it will allow you to either stop the actual processing of upload or continue, but it would drop that specific record. Um, and that information is also provided on the data quality report um, once if you decide to proceed with the upload. So I already have an actual uh, data quality report open. So I'm just going to navigate to that so we can just take a look. And so basically the way that you would encounter or open that record is just basically clicking on the view reports link. And so that would open up in another tab and it would just show you the results of that submission. And so once you open up the report, you will have the available filters to allow you to review cases that are deemed as analyzed or non-analyzed. And there are five questions that drive those filters that basically indicate that the case is an analyzed case. And so these two filters here are specifically looking for those answers. And so let's take a look at the form so I can just point you to, and you can associate what that is pointing to. Hopefully I can get to the form. It's hard for me to navigate, hold on. Let's try to get to it. This bar is hiding my fields. Give me a minute. Uh, I don't know how to move. Let's see if I can move it this way. Here we go. Okay, here we go. So the questions that I'm referring to that fall in line with those filters, you'll see those questions here. And those are located on the operative tab. 
um, within this form. There, for the 2.3 version, I believe it's still on the operative form, but it's two questions that it's looking for. Um, but 2.41, it's looking at these five questions. And so if all of these questions are answered as no, then that basically places that case in the non-analyzed bucket. If one of these questions are answered as yes, it shifts that case into the analyzed filter bucket. Um, so that's what drives that um, filtering. So let me try to move this back. Sorry about that, if I can move that out of the way. There we go, back here. And then you'll see that there's additional filters for major and minor, and it looks at the actual codes that are associated in regards to major, um, codes that are, are affiliated as a major case, our major code, um, and then also you have the minor codes. So if you're only interested in looking at cases that are in the respective buckets of non of analyzed or major, you would just deselect those actual filters. And then the items that are listed in the report are basically just those cases that are deemed as analyzed or major cases. Then we do have another option that will allow you to continue to refine the list. Um, if you see that there is a option or a filter that says duplicate, because there are times in which you may have a record that um, appears and it doesn't encounter any errors, but it will say that it basically has updated or been added to the database already, it was already identified, um, and you don't wanna see those messages, there would be a filter that would allow you to basically remove those. And right now I don't have any of those, so that's why you don't see the additional filter that's labeled as duplicate. But if you did, that basically would allow you to take those out of the list. Um, so that was just an additional filter. So within the actual um, report, you're able to highlight this pie chart, and I've showed this a couple of times, but for those that may not be familiar with it, but if you were to, let's say, want to only focus on the warnings, you could go ahead and select that portion of the pie chart, and then it would update and only show the warnings associated to those cases. If you only wanted to focus on the errors, you could select that portion of the pie, and then the, the list would refine, and you would only see the errors. And then if you wanted to see the combination, you would just left click on your mouse, and you would hold it and drag it across the pie graph. And as you can see, there's a shading that happens. And once you let go, it actually would bring all of the available results and update all respective sections with that. Okay, so just wanted to show you that. Um, and then the other thing that's available is if you wanted to export the list that's available, um, you wanted to pull that into maybe Excel you could right click on the actual bottom portion as you're seeing there, and you do have the option to export. You can export to table, export to table without formatting. And basically that would bring you into a spreadsheet view. Um, if you're using, a lot of times we'd get the question in regards to what if we don't use Microsoft Excel? This is the way that you would use to export that. Um, if you're using a different type of program. If you did want to export to Microsoft Excel, you would, of course, use this option that's available to export to Excel. Okay. And then the other thing that I wanted to also show is that if you wanted to see the full list, you do have the ability within the uh, interface to bring up, you'll notice that my mouse turned into a double-sided arrow um, where you're able to drag this section here and you're able to make this bigger if you wanted to, but if you wanted to maximize to show this in your entire screen, you could use the option by right-clicking and there is an option where it said maximize and that would bring you into this full screen um, view. And then to go back, you would just right-click again choose the option to restore the visualization layout, and that would bring you back 
to the previous view. OK, but you do have a way if you want it to just manipulate on the screen certain um, sections or components, you're able to do that also. OK, so just wanted to call that out. The other thing that I wanted to show you is there is an additional report. It's kind of hidden, but it's called a critical summary report. So you'll see that right below in the left corner, you have the data quality report and then you will have the critical summary report and this is where you're able to get the raw details of your submissions and so i've already pre-populated a date range where i know i had some submissions and here you're able to see based on my submission date this is not the surgery date you're able to enter in that date range and you're able to see each submission that was done and here is where you're able to see the first surgery date and then the last surgery date for that actual submission file. Okay, so we get a lot of questions around that, like how do we determine and basically confirm the date range. You're able to do that with this report. You're also able to review the file status. So if you remember on that first screen, on that uploader history screen, there was a failed submission that I showed. It had that circle with the red X. And that submission basically did not, um, it, it failed. So you're able to actually see that entry. And this is the confirmation to show that no records were uploaded. Um, for that submission. But all of the other ones that you see here, those basically passed. And then you would see the total number of records that were in the file, and then the total number of records that were successful and posted to the database. So this is the confirmation. If there were any records within that actual file that had an issue where it could not be um, saved, you would see the record count here for failed records. And if by chance you had records that were already in the database and they had no changes within that submission, you would see those counts. So those would basically be a confirmation of the records were in the submission, but they were identified as being in the database already. Therefore, no changes were made and you would actually see that count of records here. And then you have the link to be able to open up that data quality report. So this would basically open up the report that we were just looking at. Um, and so that basically would bring you back to this initial um, result set that we were just reviewing. But if you wanted to look at any other, then you were able to open up that and it would open up in another tab and you would be able to review that also instead of having to go back to the initial uploader page and then selecting the view report link to open that up you're able to get to it just by using these links okay so just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of that so i will close out of the data quality report and the next report that we can take a look at is the missing variable report. And I already have that up and ready. And here, once we have the report open, you'll see that we again have the filters available, same concept as what I had described before in regards to the analyze, non-analyze, major and minor filters. And again, if you are only interested in focusing on your analyzed and major cases, then you would deselect the non-analyzed and minor, and you will notice that the counts actually updated. And so I have an example here where for this cigarette smoking, I have 11 cases um, out of 95 that have been identified as being missing. And so once I take a look or select this, it will populate the results down below. I can then navigate to the actual case by clicking on the link. And I actually had that case already open. And here I just wanted to point out, let me just move this again. Let's see, let's shift this up a little bit. All right. And here, what I wanted to point out is we know that we have errors that are currently showing up.
Um, so this is just pointing back to the uploader where it had that X. Um, you can see that in this instance, you're able to see those same errors that would pop up on the uploader report, and you're able to review those within the case forms also. So you're able to navigate from the DQR. So what I wanted to show you here is that if you select this icon of the clipboard with the check mark, it's going to show you all of the related errors for that record. And so you're able to see that here. And the field that we were just looking at on the MBR was cigarette smoking. So I'm just going to click on that actual message for cigarette smoking. And you'll notice that it flipped me to the page. And you'll see that it brought me to where cigarette smoking is. So you're able to immediately get to that field and review that. Now, my permission is, is different, so I just want to call that out. Um, my permission allows me to do direct data entry, so that's why you may see additional buttons that some of you may not be familiar with seeing. Um, for the uploader only um, users, you will not have the ability to, of course, make changes to the forms. Um, but for those that are doing direct data entry, you will have the ability to, of course, make changes and save those changes to the form. So just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of the navigation that's available, um, that you're able to see the outstanding error messages, warnings, and you're able to then select those and it will bring you to the section within the report. And in regards to the MBR, it did call out that cigarette smoking was missing. And as we can see, it's missing. So for those that are uploading, you would of course make those changes within your software vendor system and then re-upload that file to then make sure that those changes get into the platform. Okay, and that would automatically update and enter in that um, information for you. So just wanted to uh, show you in regards to how the MBR works. I'm sure many of you are familiar with going through this, especially having already gone through uh, a couple of harvest clothes. But for those that are new, we just want to make sure that you um, are aware also. You do have the capability of selecting if you want it to get a list of all of your missing fields and export the list because you'll notice right now I only selected the one for cigarette smoking. So those are the um, results that are showing below. But we've had questions that have asked, uh, how do we get a full list? And the way you can do that is to left click on your mouse and you'll see that again, it, the shading starts to occur. And then you would just drag that all the way down to the bottom you let go of your mouse and that will highlight all of the cells and you will see that all of the results are available down below. And in that instance, if you wanted to export, you would just right click and export either again through export table or using the Microsoft Excel export. All right, so that's how you're able to get the full list if that's what you're interested in seeing. Okay, so the next thing we wanted to point out is the harvest summary report. So I will open that up. And the harvest summary is going to allow you to see all of the validations that are available at a holistic level. Um, it's not only by submissions. So in this instance, if I'm interested in seeing the surgical time frame of 2019, not 2010, all the way through, I'll say today's date, even though I know I have nothing. Um, I could go ahead and put in a specific time frame here and then generate the report to show me all of the outstanding validations that need to be addressed. Um, and so you'll see we have, again, the filters that are available. If I'm not interested in resolving messages related to the non-analyzed cases, I could go ahead and deselect and same for the minor. And then you'll see that the percentage has gone down um, and majority of what I have is no outstanding validations. And so if I wanted to get a list of all of those error messages, I would just select that portion of the pie chart and then it would show me 
all of those related messages. Same thing in regards to exporting, right click, and it will go ahead and provide you the options to export, okay? Just as what we had discussed before, same concept. Okay, so that is harvest summary. And then let me go back. The last one that we will review is the participant dashboard. And I think I have that open already. Yes. So let's just take a look at that. Participant dashboard, you're able to again select a predefined time frame, or you're able to enter in a specific date range. And the next thing that you would enter in is your procedures. You'll have the option for all. And the all in this instance is respective to what you're seeing in regards to um, esophageal, hiatal hernia, lung cancer, thymus, tr tracheal resection. The none selection is actually all other procedures that are entered into the database. So if it's not one of these, it's being classified as none. Um, we have received some feedback um, where this should be renamed. So we are looking at that to basically make it more clear in regards to all other procedures are basically listed within this category. Okay, so we did get feedback from um, data managers related to that, just to, of course, make sure that it is more clear. So I went ahead and selected all. And so um, once I did that, I went ahead and ran the report already. Let me just hide the parameters so you can get a better view. And here is the results based on what I've selected. And you can see that the dashboard is broken into the different sections, which align with the data collection form. And here you're able to see the total number of cases related to your site versus the STS. With this, um, with this current view, um, you will be able to see as you're uploading updates to your my site data okay and so that information once you've uploaded then it does take a little bit of time i would say maybe five to eight minutes usually is a time frame where you've uploaded and then that information is processed and pushed over into the analytics database and that is where that information is um, pulled for this report and then you would see if you've added new cases this number could potentially of course go up um, so always keep in mind that it's transactional so anytime you've done any kind of updates that information depending on the date range that you've updated for this number would change um, so I know that another thing that we wanted to point out is that, of course, you're able to do the same type of export feature if you wanted to select certain fields. So if you wanted to, let's just say for the questions that are listed here, if you wanted to get um, information and export those actual results, you could go in and highlight those different um, those different cells, and you're able to then update the list that's showing down below, and you're able to export that also. We are continuing to work on additional enhancements to the report, um, printing being one of those. Um, so know that we are listening to your feedback, and we have heard the feedback in regards to being able to do, of course, the one, um, hit the print one time and can you give us all of the different sections in one report so we are looking to being able to provide that um, so let me just take a look I think that's the main things that I wanted to make sure that we covered and we can go over to questions if we have any so I will stop sharing at the moment hold on and we can see if there's any questions. So I, I only see one question right now. Um, once Carol gets the slides back up, I'll um, just run through the remainder of the slides real quick. And then, of course, um, while I'm running through the slides, if anyone has any questions, um, please uh, put those in the Q&A so we can address those. Um, but real quick, um, again, you all are very familiar with the support plan. 
Um, just please be sure to include your five-digit uh, participant ID um, in any and all communications with STS and ITVIA just helps us out immensely. Um, you have the phone number there as well as the um, email for support. Again, please feel free to call or email support with any of your <clears throat> any and all questions. Um, next slide, please. Um, here is just a list of resources available to you um, on the STS website. And again, the ITVIA contact information and phone support number. Um, we also have the STS National Database Feedback Form that is located out on the STS website. So uh, please feel free to use that form to provide any feedback uh, to STS. Um, that'll be shared with um, ITVIA as well. Um, good feedback, bad feedback, things, um, enhancements, things you'd like to see. Um, so please uh, feel free to use that form. Um, there is also a list of the resources uh, listed here available to you out on the STS website as well. <clears throat> Next slide, please. As always, here's my contact information. If you have any questions about the thoracic database or have any issues you'd like to discuss, uh, please feel free to email me directly or give me a call. Um, my number is listed there. If you have any database operational questions regarding access to the platform, um, direct data entry, questions regarding your contracts and current contacts, uh, please email us at stsdb at sts.org. Next slide. And just to go ahead and um, mark your calendars, our upcoming webinars for Thoracic, our next user group call is scheduled April 28th at 2.30 Central. And our next uh, monthly webinar is scheduled for May 12th at 1.30 Central. So be sure to uh, mark your calendars accordingly. And uh, we look forward to you all joining us on our next call. <laughs> and I think that's it in terms of slides. Um, we have a few questions coming in now. Um, so let's go ahead and tackle those. I see a tour for you, Melanie. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and tackle this first one from Mary. Um, due to COVID-19 last year, the STS allowed sites latitude in completing PFT for major lung resections. Um, is this still in effect? We are still having a good number of pre-op visits done virtually, except for the full h &P, and some patients are still hesitant to travel unless necessary. Um, so I have not heard any anything otherwise. Um, we are still, I think the task force is still, um, it's still using that, so that rule is still in effect. I don't know, Carol, have you heard anything um, different um, in the training manual? Right now, you know, the task force does understand that they're difficult to obtain. If you do not have it um, due to COVID, um, we ask that you um, answer no um, to PFTs <clears throat> and then code, code the variable as no and indicate that the patient was unable to to perform for sequence number 920. So for the uh, PFT not performed reason. But um, I don't know, Carol, did, um, has, the task, has the surgeon leaders discussed anything about um, adjusting the timeframes for collecting this COVID information? No, not that I'm aware of, Ian. Mm -hmm. right. All right. Um, I'll be happy, actually we have a task force call coming up um, this month and um, I can um, definitely raise that to the surgeons if they are they have any other information about um, that time frame. Um, looks like the following questions um, from you are for you, Mel. Um, can you ex export more than one patient ID at a time from the case list? Okay, and I guess if that person can just confirm, are they direct data entry? I'm just trying to make sure because there is a case list for the direct data entry users, and the answer oh. to that is yes. No, and yeah, yeah. Entry, he's saying. Okay, yeah, he's no, saying. okay, and and anywhere that I showed where you're able to do an export, you are able to export all of the of the patients that are on that list. So it, it doesn't restrict you. So hopefully that clears up the question. If not, then I can, um, if you can put put the question back in again. I can always show if, if I need to. Yeah, just like, can, um, can you export them into the same workbook? So if she, hold on, let's, let me just bring back up my screen. So okay. we'll just do that real quick. Can I take this other question from Nancy regarding yeah. um, the AQO, virtual AQO, while you do that, yeah. Mel? Okay, Go ahead. I'm stop sharing my screen here. Uh, Nancy's asking if all data managers at a facility are allowed to attend the virtual AQL. So all data managers who are associated with a PID with who have an active role at an active site 
um, will have free admission to AQL, you'll still need to register, but you're, you will not need to pay. If it's a data manager who is not associated with a PID, an abstraction company or something like that, uh, they will need to pay a fee and those fees are still being decided. But for all data managers who are associated with the PID, as long as you're listed as uh, an active PID in an active role, then your um, admission to AQO will be free. Thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. um, I see your screen, Mel. Okay. So, and I'm wondering if they're saying in regards to with each separate report, it is a separate spreadsheet. I'm not sure if they are asking if all of the results for the different reports could be in one workbook. Um, but if you are exporting your list, for example, from the data quality report, that will be its own workbook. And then if I'm going to do the same export feature from any other report, the MBR or the dashboard, again, those are treated separately. So hopefully that answered the question. Okay. Um, yes. So thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Our next question is um, from Elizabeth. Um, on the MBR, when I hit the clipboard, it does not highlight all the missing fields in that case, but it does highlight if there was a warning on the DQR. Mm -hmm. Should it be shown in fields? Not the missing fields, no. Those errors are specifically related it would tie back to your DQR, those validations on the DQR. For the missing, it does not highlight those on the case form at this time. Um, but basically here, it's just letting you know which fields, and then it's just gonna bring you to the case. But at that point, you would have to know where that field is located to review it. Okay, thank you. Um, I see we are at time. I've got one more question, so I wanted to um, answer this question before we um, before we end. So, are there any plans to add reports to the IQVIA platform for thoracic, similar to the reports available for cardiac? So, I'm I'm assuming you are meaning the risk adjusted results, um, benchmark reports, um, your benchmark data. Um, so that information is coming. Um, those um, dashboards are built out. We are like getting that um, analysis data set from uh, DCR to display that your 2020 spring and fall analysis results within the IQVIA platform. So um, I think that's what you mean um, or, or are referring to, but I'm not sure. Carol, does that sound familiar? Are there any other like reports within your cardiac that no, may not be? I, I, I'm not sure. I think that that's probably what they're referring to. Yeah, the risk adjusted and also the longitudinal is also yes. an, another one that's yes. coming. Yes. Um, all right, I'm not seeing any additional questions. And again, um, we're a couple of minutes over. I just wanted to thank everybody for joining me today. Um, thanks to all of my STS colleagues, IQVIA and our core group members, Melissa and Katie. Thank you guys for joining. Um, I hope you all have a great uh, rest of the day. And um, as always, this recording will be posted and the slides available up on the STS website within a couple of days. So um, thank you all for joining today. I hope you all have a great week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Leanne. Great job. Thanks, everybody.